In this episode of Adventures in Archiving, I unbox a great computer, encounter various load errors while archiving, fix a broken tape, and use a printer. Exciting, I know. Let's start the video. I thought it would be a good idea to continue with the whole archiving endeavor and try to make the first episode of Adventures in Archiving. While scripting this, the video is over 20 minutes, which is very long for this channel. Let's see what we can boil it down to. I wanted to give an update on my archive site, but we'll save that info for a separate video. I think for now it is best to focus on the archiving we have to do. It all started as many things do on this channel with a box from the Dutch version of eBay, containing various, I have to say, lovely products from Radio Shack. All boxed and all in pretty nice condition. The main attraction is in this box, a box that makes it pretty clear what's inside. I like how simple but yet sophisticated this packaging is. Does anyone know what the date code means? Let's look under the hood. We immediately see some goodies. These seem to be cartridges for the color computer, Polaris and color file. Nice. A manual which inside had this reference card of some kind. Color Basic for beginners in Dutch, accompanied by an even deeper dive into Color Basic, also in Dutch. Love how this documentation is so detailed, where documentation that comes with computers nowadays just tells you not to choke on the keyboard and not to submerge it underwater, well not when it's plugged in. A lovely color computer appears when we remove this piece of styrofoam. This of course is not my first color computer. I have a color computer too as well, a machine that got me quite interested in the platform. Interesting keyboard. I have to say I'm really excited to be adding this to my collection. I said that the main attraction was the computer, but immediately when I said that I realized that it's actually not true, because of what is hiding in this box. To be honest, if this was not included, I would not have bought it. I don't really see the point in having a lot of one type of computer. Well, rare computer, like the color computer, which don't show up that often on the Dutch version of eBay. That rule I for instance don't apply to the C64, of which many are still out there. I'd rather see them, in this case the Cocos, go to other collectors. Later I found out this is a Color Computer 1, so enough difference there. But this lot came with software, something that you don't see often, and software of course is what I'm after for my archiving endeavors. So that's why I jumped on it. But another big selling point to me were the joysticks that were included. These two even in the original packaging. I never actually look for computers that come with the packaging, but have to say that I really like all this Radio Shack branded cardboard here. Where the computers don't show up often, I have seen joysticks for the Coco pop up maybe once or twice over a three year period. That is why I said in my original color computer video that I would be looking into making an adapter for more common joysticks. With me now having four, I don't think I need to bother. I'm thinking about selling two of them to other collectors, but I'm not sure yet, as I really don't like selling stuff. The joysticks are quite loose. I wonder how they work. I believe there are also other versions of Coco compatible joysticks. The cassettes came in two of these plastic containers that you can connect together. In the bottom, another cartridge game, or should I say program pack. Galactic Attack, and this cassette player by Realistic, which did work but recently died on me, probably because of bad caps or something. Let's take the computer out of the box. Oh, some documentation hiding under the computer. Nothing too particularly special. Always fun that people wrote down certain basic commands to remember, or little programs. Let's put it on this desk, which matches the silvery look. The computer is a little bit grimy, something that only shows when you zoom in. For instance, these corners, or the center part of the keyboard. So I'm going to give it a quick wipe with some window cleaner. Not a bad idea when taking a look at this cleaning rack. The cases used on this type of computer are painted plastic, so when cleaning them you have to be very careful with what chemicals you use. I like to use 96% alcohol to clean stuff, but with this case, that will probably remove some of the paint, instead of cleaning it. The computer cleaned up pretty nicely. Time for a quick test. I put in the Galactic Attack cartridge. Sound and video. It works. Nice. I have to say that Galactic Attack is a pretty neat game for this platform. Really nice to play. I had it in my color computer too for a couple days, so I could occasionally play it. So now moving on to the tapes we have to preserve. Let's see what we got. These five tapes clearly appear to be original games. We have Cutbird Goes Walkabout, Dungeon Raid, Frogger, Crazy Painter and The King. Then we have about nine tapes labeled computer cassettes and four what the original owner called test tapes. Oh, and one named Church Bookkeeping. 
So for archiving cassettes, I mainly use my trusty small form factor Technix RS6. Let's turn it on. Where you could look up how to archive tapes online, because there are probably a bunch of articles written about it, I tend to take the route of just figuring out by myself. You could argue that it's not the most efficient way, but it's a way I quite enjoy. Makes it more an adventure, I guess. And in the troubleshooting process, when things don't work, you learn about the computers as well. I know that you have a pretty boring life when digitizing tapes is an adventure to you, but whatever floats your boat, I guess. So what I like to do is to take a tape with just one game on it, in this case Frogger. I choose a tape like that because those most of the time are not too long to record, which you can clearly see when taking a look through the plastic window showing the tape. Let's put it in the RS6. I have the RS6 connected to my Mac Mini using a U-Control UCA202 ultra low latency 2-in 2-out USB audio interface with digital output. Well that's what it's called on the box, shortened down RCA to USB I would say. I know when it comes to computer cassettes that the low quality deck is in the most cases sufficient, but I like to do things using this nifty USB device, which is also great for recording spoken audio which in the future will be handy for other projects. Then I open Audacity, yes I know spyware, but a functional spyware. The spies probably having loads of fun with all my old programs. Select the USB device, click record and press play on the tape deck. When digitizing tapes, mostly I look at the screen during the beginning to see if some audio shows up and then leave it recording until the end of the tape is reached. In this case, it being only one program, digitizing went fast and I exported the file to a WAV file format with the file name Frogger Test 1. I like to label the artist name as Archived by Retromels. One thing I said slash complained about in my first color computer video was that I couldn't get a cassette adapter to work with the color computer. All the googling I did only gave me results of people directly connecting their modern day computer to the color computer and using special programs to load WAV files or CAS files. Let's come back to this in a moment and first focus on seeing if we can make the software I just digitized work with an emulator. For no particular reason I chose XROAR to try this with. It is available for Windows and Mac, although I never got it running on the latter, so I will be using XROAR on Windows, with ROMs from the wonderful Color Computer Archive. To get my files working with XROAR I assumed that I would need to convert them to COS file type, a file type I had seen used in other emulator programs. So I looked this up and found a certain program called wave to cas I believe this used to be a command prompt program that got converted to be used with the GUI. I tried multiple different tapes with the program, but none of them appeared to work, getting various error messages. I saw on different fora that other people encountered the same issues. So for a short while I wasn't sure what to do. On the IRA Goldkling site, there were more programs available, but they all appeared to be quite old. I don't remember why, but I decided to try just to see if it would be able to just load the WAV file. So I loaded it in and typed cloadm. And lo and behold, it loaded. Wonderful. So time to start digitizing all the tapes that came with this lovely color computer one. I think this computer, I say computer a lot in this video, I realize now, came from a collector, as this tape is labeled game slash dragon. I assume the dragon part refers to the Dragon 32 or 64. Interesting. While the tapes are digitizing, I wanted to see if this printer that also came with the computer still works. Finally, the seller asked if I wanted the printer included for a certain price. I never really responded to that, but did ask the seller for a slight reduction in the overall price, which he accepted. This looks like a nice printer too. I don't have a lot of printers compatible with basic computers. This is a 4 pen color graphic printer. It sort of looks like a classy receipt printer. Let's take it out of the box. On top, some documentation. Of course, the documentation, whether it's already available online or not, will also be added to my archive. A very in-depth manual that also has a lot of basic listings. Nice. And there's the printer itself. And then something dramatic. Something stuck to the back. That's awesome. <laughs> Which is like pathetic. Oh my god, it's pens in the packaging. 
Yes, I didn't see that there were also some pens still in the packaging and responded a bit too overexcited to that. I thought it would be safe to test the power supply before I used it with the printer. And I'm happy I did, as the power supply was outputting more than needed by the printer. So I looked around and found a replacement and turned it on. It did its startup routine which prints four squares, of which two were visible, the others not. The ink in those pens probably has dried up. I typed the first listing I found in the manual, to see if it worked with the computer, to which it was connected via the serial cable. Typed run and got an SN error. Strange. I tried the test sequence by holding the paper feed button on power on, which worked. Then when looking at the manual I realized that the basic listings have two variations, for the color computer or for the TRS-80. With the difference being LPrint used for the TRS-80 and print hashtag dash 2 used for the color computer. So then I typed a listing containing that. And ran it. It worked, took some time, but this printer I now officially understand. And here are some of the other things it printed. Then I typed another listing which drew a stripe, not too special. Back to the issue with the cassette adapter. I had an epiphany and made the following explainer video about it. Of course you have my Coco files on my archive. And I always thought that it wasn't possible to load them using a cassette adapter but I've been playing around and it's actually pretty simple and it all boils down to being in mono because the Coco only accepts mono audio. So if you download a cassette tape from my Coco archive and then just select a file, let's say we try this one and then just hook up your cassette player with one of these cassette adapters in it, it should work. So we're just going to try that with my color computer too. So I have my color computer hooked up to this Philips TX14 television and we're going to type C load and it will show the S. Then we go over to the player and press play, which will, then we go over to the computer and press play in Audacity, and as you will see, and with this game it goes really fast, but it's recognized and then it's loading, I think this program is about a minute and 20-30 seconds long, and then it will return an OK. Then you type run because it's a basic program. And the game is ready. Press any key to start. So contrary to what I thought in my first color computer video, you can also use yes, a cassette adapter to load software onto a color computer. So it turns out that it's pretty easy, just mono audio. While digitizing the cassette tapes, I encountered one tape that was a bit weird. It didn't have any writing on it, so I wasn't sure what was going to be on it. So I put it in the player and rewound. Well, I thought I was rewinding it, but the tape counter wasn't moving and it made a weird sound. Then, when looking closer, I realized the tape had snapped. So I opened the shell. It is clear where the break is. The header got detached from the magnetic tape. So as I won't be using this cassette anymore and I just want to get things off it, I'm going to fix it in a quick and easy way with some of this double-sided tape. If I want what's on here to be on a tape again, I'll just record a new tape. So I attached the double-sided tape to the header and then fiddled some and attached it to the magnetic tape. Organized it in the shell and closed it. Not too difficult as long as you keep the big part of tape safely on the spool. I put it in the cassette deck and started recording, the tape counter now moving. But sadly it appears that there is nothing on the tape, on either side. Shame. So now that all the files are digitized, I want to take a look at a couple programs, in no particular order. I have the Coco hooked up to this Philips monitor. 
With the Radio Shack cassette deck, the printer is also connected and I have my laptop ready with my archive. The laptop is connected to the cassette deck using the cassette adapter. So let's try some programs. Again I use Audacity, make sure to change the files to mono as showed in the explainer video. Audacity tends to load them as stereo again. So what you will find when typing this is that the first time you get an IO error. This happened to me a lot. So I changed the audio level a bit and try again. So now we see it recognize the header. Still not loaded though. I tried something stupid. It appeared to give the error right around the dip in audio. I wanted to remove that and see what would happen. As a future project I want to try to see if I can fix cassette tape files that don't want to load. But as expected that didn't work. These files also appear not to work with XROAR. But still these programs will be available on the archive for anybody interested in taking a look at them. Also I wonder if there might be a compatibility issue between the Dragon and the Coco. As this might be Dragon software. I had no time to set up a Dragon emulator but maybe I'll look into that when I have some time to spare. I moved on to a different tape. IO error. Ugh, it is so interesting that, that when you try tape files they work and then later they don't. But tweaking your settings will most of the time fix these issues. Old computers can be hard to please. Remember that when downloading files of my archive these are really for people that just want to thinker a bit. Also take into account that a lot of these files are in Dutch or a mixture of English and Dutch. I want to see if I maybe can use an AI tool and emulators or modern tape programs to translate the Dutch basic code to English, but only if I find an efficient way to get the basic code of the tapes. Any input on that is welcome. But then finally the computer returned an OK and we can type run. Sadly this is not an exciting game or program. No, this is called budget and it lets you make a sort of budget in Dutch. I know, shocking. But loading is good, I guess. The next program is called battle. SH. That sounds way more exciting, although loading also was a bit weird, as again I get an SN error. Let's list the program. Always gives Matrix or Hackery vibes, I think, but after listing it, it loads. I have to say I really like this program. It is a mixture of Dutch and English and is like the game Battleship, which is probably not a shocker to. You will place boats on a map and then play against the computer or another player on one screen. Kind of wonder how that works, actually. I managed to hit one of the computer ships on the first try but then had a lot of trouble finding the others. While digitizing on this tape, test tape 1, I found something interesting. When I looked at Audacity while it was being recorded, I thought it was corrupted because it didn't look like clean computer audio. But then playing it back, I heard this. Someone mixed themselves practicing trumpet playing onto a cassette that on the other side contained computer programs. Interesting. This was not the only tape with trumpet music on it, as on the archive you will find a second recording. Didn't expect I would be sharing music on that side. Back to the Coco. Another game was called Brotan. It at first froze, but the second time loaded, and was weird. Did not quite get how to play it. MoCalc gave back OK and when I typed run it gave back OK again. So I listed the program and thought I saw some print commands. So I turned on the printer to see if running the program maybe would output something to the printer. Then I realized that the way I turned off the printer resulted in a big ink stain which looked funny. Let's see what happens when the printer is connected. Oh, now it loads a sort of database but then gives an FC error. Let's list line 140 for the people that maybe know something about basic. Electric is a sort of demo program. PyCirca was a program that uses the printer to draw sort of pie charts. So let's change the pens of the printer to get a little bit better results when printing. It has this nice switch to put the pen holder in the right position. They came with these caps to keep the ink protected, although after 40 years it is probably long gone. I checked the manual to make sure I wouldn't break anything and changing the pens proved to be pretty easy. Going through the test sequence I can see the pen actually has a little bit more ink as the black color is much more clear. So when I print something with the PyCirc program it is much more clear. I really like this program called CAS Label. It asks for a title and the artist's name and then tracks. When you press enter it will print that. 
print it in such a way that you can use it in a standard cassette shell. Very handy and when I now think about it, a program the previous owner actually used for the cassettes that it came with. The programs I now show are of course the more simple shareware slash typing kind. But you will also find the better quality games like Frogger on my archive site. I got an FM error when I tried loading the king, but that is of course because instead of cload, here you need to type cload m, then it will load fine. XOR is of course much more fast. The king is an interesting game, a bit hard to play with a tripod in the way though. And when loading this game, the computer made a sort of relay type sound. This is Cutbird Goes Walkabout. It is an interesting program. With that game, I want to wrap up my 20 or so minute adventure in archiving color computer cassettes. Impressive if you made it all the way here. On my archive site, you will now find the tape files and instructions on how to use them with your Coco or with x All the documents featured will soon appear on the website as well. I really like the Coco, so I probably will feature it again on this amateur channel. Archiving is pretty tedious, so I think the next video I will look at something a little bit more simple. But for now, I want to thank you for watching.